40 years has been good for me, but I don't know that I can say that for Kramer. <laughs> when I went there 40 years ago this coming Sunday, they were looking for a preacher, and they're still looking for one. <laughs> what a great crowd on Sunday night. This is a couple more than what we have on Sunday night. <laughs> and I appreciate you giving your preachers the night off. This is a, a good time for them to uh, be together and uh, come over to the Sailorsburg Church. Now, I, I'm not one that really believes in omens, but uh, things, things do happen. Four o'clock, I was leaving my house, and uh, as I'm walking in my car, this attractive lady and her little son were approaching my door and she uh, gives me this tract. Says, how do you view the future? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm on my way to Sellersburg, Indiana to <coughs> preach about the future. And isn't that a coincidence? Well, could we, well, I'm sorry, I don't have time. But I will take the track and I'll pass it along. Paul, I thought maybe you could take it and if you want to answer some of the questions that are presented in this track. On the back it's got that little JW, what's that? <laughs> anyway, it'll be up here for whoever may want to look at that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Brother David, for that uh, kind and brief introduction. I really get more, not so much from Benny Hinn, but uh, Benny Hill, the English comedian. And, and I, I claim no uh, relation. To, it's, it's hard enough to stay out related to Steve Hill, but anyway. <laughs> I did tell him they, there's been a change in the program that uh, they'd like for me to leave the singing, and uh, they like for you to stick on signs of the times. He said, well, he does that all the time, so Steve, you're welcome to uh, come. Now, you only got a few minutes. But last time I spoke on the signs of the times in a special Bible prophecy conference was November the 17th, 1993, at the Central Louisiana Fellowship in Glenmora, Louisiana, on the program. Uh, Monday night was Julius Hovan. Tuesday night, Paul Kitzmiller spoke. And I, I remember, vaguely remember, Paul went about 30 minutes over the time given him. And uh, I, I didn't think the same thing then, so I thought I'd say something now. <laughs> uh, but uh, I spoke on Wednesday night, and Brother Emory Grimes spoke on Thursday night. David Johnson and Randy both spoke on Wednesday. David said I had about 45 minutes to speak on this subject tonight of the signs of the times. I told him I'm going to need at least three or four hours. <laughs> but don't worry, I will watch my clock and uh, try to uh, stay within my allotted time. There's always been interest in signs of the times. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to him, Jesus, and tested him. And they asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And then in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, this time, before it was the Pharisees, Sadducees, their motivation was testing. The disciples now come to him privately, saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now there are numerous books, lists of signs of times. I have a book in my library, which probably most of the ministers here tonight, it's called Bible Lists. And it contains numerous 
Bible references on the signs of the times. Dr. David Reagan, many of you know, in his little booklet, The Master Plan, has a section, section four, on signs of the times. He deals mostly with the nation of Israel. His is very political, and I thought, when I was asked to speak on this, I, the leading wasn't to go into to the political arena. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of politics. You know, all that, that's been on the news, and uh, you know, but, but it's very contagious, and I, I just want to say, I am Benny Hill, and I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> that's all, so I, I haven't felt led to go in that direction. So if you come tonight looking for uh, some of the political signs, or the nation of Israel, that's going to be reserved for another night. And I will not be speaking on that. Others include men like John Hagee, Warren Wiersbe, Chuck Missler, Brother R.H. Bow, and, and many others. I'm sure many of the ministers here tonight would probably have a study of their own as far as signs of the times. I'm going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at just the nine verses. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. And the uh, signs that are related to current events, things that are going on in our world tonight. It's always been interesting to me that before God gets ready to do something, on earth, he forewarns us prior to his intervention, what he's going to do. He often sends signals, he sends signs that are designed to prepare us. Signs that are prepared to alert us and, and warn us for what God's going to do. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Amos chapter 3 verse 7, <clears throat> Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants. Now that's pretty clear. God warned the world before the flood back in Genesis around chapter 6. Before he sent the flood, the ark became a sign. Before the Lord uh, delivered the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. He sent the 10 plagues, you remember. And the plagues were the signs. And before he sent Israel into Babylonian captivity, there was the messengers of Elijah and Elisha, and their miracles were signs. But before he sent his son to this earth to be born of a virgin, he put a star in the heavens, and the star became a sign. And just as the first coming of Jesus was preceded with signs, I believe so will the second coming be preceded with signs. There will be signs in the world, in today's society, that I believe correspond with signs in the word. Now, in Luke 21, 28, Jesus said this, when these things, he's been talking about, if you look in the two or three verses before, when you see these things, these signs he's talking about, begin to develop, look up for your redemption is drawing near. We are without doubt living in the end times when Jesus Christ is coming. Okay. Now, let's begin our study <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 3, referring to the end of the church age. Paul would write this to this young evangelist. And he wants him to know this. Know this. I believe you're here tonight because you want to know God's Word. 
And I just believe God's going to bless you in some way. It may not be tonight directly, but I believe God's going to bless your commitment to be here tonight. And uh, we, we thank each of you churches that have made the effort to join in this special time this week. Timothy, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now the word here, perilous, is one that means heavy. It means difficult, hard to bear. It means dangerous. And it's translated in another version, grievous. The only other use of this word is in Matthew 8.28. When Jesus met the two demoniacs, you remember when he visited the region of the Gadarenes, they are described, those two demons, as exceedingly fierce. Does that not describe the day in which we live? Grievous, perilous days. Well, this is God's description. God's description of the end times. Well, due to time, or let me say lack of, I'm going to try to narrow this study down into to three points. I'll not be using PowerPoint like two or three others will be. I've not had the time to put it together, and plus my spell checker is not with me tonight, so to avoid any public humiliation by a certain person in this co um, congregation, I'll, be, I'll, I'll not be putting anything in my new print. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy the tape if you like. Or in fact, I think they're free on delivery. Well, now that's a deal. That's a deal. <clears throat> but I'm going to try to look at three different areas of this text in uh, Timothy. I'm going to talk about people first. It's the longest list. People without character. And then people without conviction. And then the third group will be people without conscience. Let's begin with people without character. First in verse 2, Paul lists a dozen things to substantiate this aspect of the end time. People will be lovers of themselves. He writes down that they will be lovers of themselves. Self-love, of course, is native to the human heart. It's something that shows itself in a child as soon as he or she is born and can express himself. Nobody has to teach a baby how to throw a temper tantrum. A healthy society, our modern society, today's world, however, imposes restraints on extreme selfishness. It recognizes the need to teach children respect for authority of their parents in the home, for their teachers in school, or for the laws of society in general. And a healthy society teaches children to be well-mannered, respectful, of persons and the property of others. Now our society, today's world, has institutionalized love for self. In other words, children must not be punished. Children must not be punished lest they become inhibited. We have things today like Time out. Or a young man go to your room. Now if my dad had given me a time out when I was growing up, I would never have made it to the room. <laughs> For the simple reason I wouldn't have been able to walk. And Steve and uh, Ben had the same dad. He was, went a whole lot linear on them. <laughs> But the discipline paid off, as you can well see. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. No, Steve, Steve, come on back. We're not through. <laughs> if kids are failing in school, the grading system's got to be adjusted. 
this is real, this is going on in, in public education. If the grading system is failing, <clears throat> then uh, it, it's got to be adjusted. Less their failure does that child's psychological harm. That's bizarre. Now, criminals, lawbreakers, they've got to be given rights. Even though they have shown no respect for the rights of those they've robbed, murdered, or maimed. Recently, a police chief summed up our generation <clears throat> by calling it a lost, a lost generation. He said it's a generation that thumbs its nose at everything once held sacred. He described it as a generation addicted to drugs, given to self-indulgence, contempt for the law, and totally without regard for social values. In other words, he's describing the same kind of generation that Paul is talking about right here. Men will be not only lovers of themselves, but also in verse 2, they will be lovers of money. That's materialism. The craving, the obsession for the good life has lured millions of people into a hopeless death. And as a nation, we are a people living, addicted to living beyond our means in order to gratify the things that we want. <clears throat> this old-fashioned ideal of working and saving for what we want, that's long since been abandoned. You know, that, that's a generation ago. Our love for money and the things that money can buy has saddled millions of people hopelessly into debt. Let's go on to the next in verse 2. Paul says that in the last days, people would be boastful, they will be proud, they will be abusive. And nowhere in society is that better reflected than in the popular music of our day. How a generation looks at life is often reflected in its music. I think it, you can tell a lot about a generation by the kind of music that we like. One generation gives birth to hymns, another to marital or patriotic songs, another to romantic melodies. Our generation, today's generation, is obsessed with rock. Rock, hard rock, punk rock, acid rock. And don't ask me to tell you the difference. It's just rock. It's just rock. And it's often described in the vocabulary of a lot of young people. Man, that's awesome. Boy, that's cool. It's rock. And it identifies that the music of today's is filled with the contemptuous attitudes toward human life and society. It's, it's the music of a generation that is defiant and many times rebellious, blasphemous and proud and yet at the same time is music that is gripped by an overwhelming sense of despair. <clears throat> the lyrics of today's music, if you can understand them, I guess that's one of the advantages of losing your hearing. But if you can understand, if you can see the words, it, it often glorifies sin and rebellion. I'd like to take a little closer look at this third word here. <coughs> it's the word abusive. This I believe to be one of the most subtle signs around us today. And the reason why it's ignored is because it's seen in so many different areas. First is child abuse child abuse. Now this takes the form of battering, uh, neglecting children, infants, 
Nationally, we're told over two million cases of child abuse are reported in the United States, with perhaps as many not reported. Each year, an estimated 2,000 children die from child abuse. And I read those statistics and I just wondered, why? Why is there so much child abuse in our country today? And then I believe I come up with this. Apparently our children are under attack. Child abuse, under attack. Twice before, in biblical history, there have been contracts put out on our children. And at both times, there were parents, well, there was supernatural protection first. And that was because of parents who intervened for their children. Parents who prayed. Well, the ultimate of child abuse is death. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, in the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 12. From the king of Egypt, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and you see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, you shall kill it. That became the law. But if it's daughter, she shall live. Contract number one. Over in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in the districts from two years old and under. It became the law. Contract number two. More recent, current, January the 22nd, 1970, contract number three has come out once again on our children and especially now on the unborn. <coughs> when the highest court, the ruling body authorities in our land, in a landmark decision with the Roe versus Wade decision, legalized the killing of infants in their mother's womb. Legalized murder, not just killing, it became law. Contract number three has again come out in our generation of all the child abuse. We softened it up a little bit. We call it abortion, but it's legalized murder. And we're going to stand under God's judgment. The contract on our children has come in our generation. It's come on our children. Have you ever wondered about Satan's tactics to destroy the church? He targets young people. That's who he goes after. Young people. To get them to rebel. Get out from under parental authority as soon as you can. They're old phobies. What do they know? But you know what's interesting to me? Each time the contract went out in the Old Testament under Pharaoh and under Herod here in Matthew 2, a deliverer was involved. And I've wondered, as I've studied these things, could this be the generation? Could our age be the generation that's going to witness the coming of the Deliverer? It happened with Moses. It happened with Jesus here in the first century. The second form of abuse, let's go on. Abuse just doesn't stop a child, but Second form of abuse is elder. Elder abuse. We're told that over 30 million people in this country 
right now are abused by their children, by their spouses, or outside caregivers. The abuse takes many forms. It may be physical abuse, the most obvious. It may be a passive neglect that's unintentionally not providing for the care of the elderly. Or it may be uh, active neglect intentionally not providing. Or it may be psychological abuse. I believe this is the worst. Because it inflicts the elderly by name calling, insulting, ignoring, humiliating, frightening, threatening, or, or just belittling the elderly. Another form of abuse is sibling abuse, where brothers and sisters don't get along, brothers and sisters don't speak. Then there's abuse of people with disabilities. It's all around us. <laughs> Slipping into the handicapped parking places or people laughing at their disability. Then there's spouse abuse. Spouse abuse. <coughs> Battering is the number one cause of injury to women in the United States. Did you get that? Battering is the number one cause of injury to women in the United States. Husbands and boyfriends kill more than 30% of all female homicide victims. Domestic violence is constantly on the rise. That not only affects the victim, it affects the children in the home who probably suffer the most. Now this takes the form, physical abuse, things like hitting, slapping, kicking. Now would not be a good time to kick your spouse to wake him up. That would be considered spouse abuse. And I can read lips pretty well too. But slapping, kicking, shoving, choking, biting, assaulting with an object, be it a frying pan or a baseball bat. Sexual abuse. Verbal, emotional abuse. Things like criticism to your spouse. Degrading remarks, name calling, accusation, threat. Well, we are an abusive society. I think the point is made. Another sign pointing to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 2. <clears throat> Next, Paul says that in the end times, here we go again, children will be disobedient to parents unfaithful. Paul, when he wrote this, I think foresaw an attack on the family unit, the home life in the last days. Paul would write to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 1, children. Young people, listen to me. Obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. This is the thing to do. So it may go well with you. You may enjoy a long life. Satan comes along and somehow influences and encourages young people to rebel, disobey. You don't need to listen to their old fogies. What do they know? You know, I'll take my computer and I'll get on Facebook. They'll never find me there. They can't operate a computer. That's the age in which we're living. Well, the roots of family problems are many and they're buried. There's a sordid divorce rate, I think, which has totally undermined the stability of the home and the authority of the parents. We're told <coughs> one in two marriages will end in divorce. That's affecting our young people. It's estimated that, an av that the average 18-year-old American youth has spent something like 22,000 hours of his formative years in front of a television set, watching. That's far more than he spends in school, if he goes every day. And during those hours of, of TV brainwashing, he is subconsciously Conditioned to a life of fantasy, violence, sex, alcohol, and amusement. 
So is the baby wonder. That disobedience to parents has become the hallmark of our age. But even conscientious parents are finding it increasingly difficult to cope with the rising tides of permissiveness tolerated by society and with the secular values that are being taught in schools. Now, schools across the country <clears throat> often ignore parental uh, objections to the liberal teaching of things like homosexuality, abortion, birth control, and sexual indulgence. And of course, God forbid that we teach the Bible in schools. Now it's interesting, some of the stories I've read that we can assign reading and discussion from almost any filthy book that comes off the press. We can invite witches and homosexuals and antichrists and even atheists to teach in our classroom and promote their ideas, but we must not teach the Bible, nor have token prayers or, or scripture reading in school. And that's been since 1963, the best year of mine in Richard and Peggy's life when we graduated from Portland Christian High School. But it's that very same year, 1963, again, when the highest court in our land ruled Bible reading and prayer is unconstitutional. And then they came back, if they didn't do enough then, in 1980, they ordered, ordered the removal of the Ten Commandments in school. Now, that's pretty current. It's going on today. And it seems to me it's all been downhill since 1963. <clears throat> so is it any wonder that a quarter of American 15-year-olds and a tenth of all 13-year-olds have experienced or experimented with premarital sex? However, counter to all this has been the rapid, rapid rise of Christian schools and home schools among parents who say enough is enough is enough. Thank God for those. Next, Paul says, unholy. People without character will be unholy. That is profane. And, and this reaches every area of society when you think about it. And it's well financed, well organized, directly by forces that are hostile <clears throat> toward our way of life, our very freedoms. Our very freedoms are being used to destroy us. With the enormous drug traffic in the United States and the Western world, the wholesale promotion of sexual excess and perversion are all a part I'm here to tell you it's all a part of a cleverly orchestrated plot to produce a decadent society, the one Paul makes reference to in Romans 1, 18 through 32. And furthermore, the communication media has infiltrated the news stories can be twisted and slanted in the interest of the end. What ever happened to old-fashioned journalism? It went out the door. And then Paul says, verse 3, people would be without natural affection. They will be truce breakers. Again, Paul foresaw a time when people in the last days, in times before Christ comes, would become cold and callous Jesus talked about this sign in Matthew 24, verse 12. He says, because of lawlessness, 
Because of lawlessness, the love of many will bind the code. You know the saddest thing about this, though? We, we see that in society. But you know the sad thing to me? It's within the body of Christ when church members become cold and callous, when church members don't speak to each other. In fact, will go out of their way to avoid somebody they just do not talk to. When members of the body of Christ will carry a grudge for years over something somebody said and kind of like the Hatfields and McCoys. Who knows? Or when members of the body of Christ cannot forgive. And sometimes when we make the invitation to, for people to come down the aisle, sometimes we, we encourage it may be necessary to go across the aisle to forgive. That's the sad thing. <clears throat> Next, Paul says that in the end times, we would see the rise of false accusers. This comes from the little Greek word diabolus, meaning slanderer or adversary. The very same word used to describe the devil. Now when Antichrist comes, we believe according to Daniel 8.25, through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper. You think it's bad now. We haven't seen anything yet. He will cause deceit to prosper. And according to 2 Thessalonians 2.10, his coming will be with all deceitfulness. He will be diabolus incarnate in the flesh. That's the very first sign. I always like when I see something that's used for the first time, I make a mark of it. The very first sign of the times of His coming, Matthew 24, 4, Jesus said, don't be deceived. Next is fierce, brutal, and without self-control. Verse 3. These words are expressive of some of the foul things that we see expressed in our society today. We are living where fierce men literally terrorize whole segments of society. Groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, there's a third group emerging, and I'm convinced the nearer, closer we get to the return of the Lord, there'll be a fourth group. There'll be a fifth. It's just a continual thing. <clears throat> there can be little doubt that international terrorism is on the rise. Terror, you see, is a favorite weapon because a bomb placed in a car in a school, in a church, on a bus, on an airplane, can influence millions of people. We still have visions of 9-11. Planes bombing are flying into the World Trade Center. We have visions of news reporters being decapitated. The greater the influence, the greater the newspaper and television coverage, the better, better. But you know the sad thing? These, these are real. I, I could have brought several illustrations, but you see them on your, your TV as I do mine, in between the uh, political stuff. <clears throat> but the greater the newspaper and television coverage, the better. But the sad thing is, it's through the news media that we are providing the enemy free coverage. Amen. They're not spending a nickel. We see. We show that. Let's go on to the second group. 
Paul's saying before Jesus comes, people will be without character. Next, people will be without conviction. This is our second group. He says that in the last days, people would be despisers of those that are good. Or one translation says they will be haters of good. An age of no conviction. Somebody once said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Paul next tells us that the last days there will be traitors. Well, there have always been traitors. What's so different about that? Jesus had his Judas. But I believe in our day, treachery has become epidemic. Movements have banded people together by the thousands for the sole purpose of betraying their homelands to foreign foes whose ideologies they've been taught to embrace. The parade of traitors is endless in the news media. Stories of soldiers who take off their uniform abandon their group of men and next thing you know they're found in other parts of the world and when they are brought back they can't seem to deal with the language the adjustments and one particular said well I, I forgot the language that God will be the ultimate judge but People abandon their convictions. We're in that age. Convictions. But as long as I'm sincere, doesn't that make matter for some things here? But what do we stand for? What do we believe? As long as we're sincere. Next, Paul says, heady, rash, high-minded, I like the translation of conceited. <clears throat> the Greek word here translated heady means headlong, it means restless. Suffice it to say, we are a restless society, not knowing the peace of God. Next, Paul says, people without conviction, there will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Well, right here, Paul stops preaching those demands. Boy. There was once a time, if you think back, if you can think back that far, there's once a time when Sunday was the Lord's Day. Publicly set aside for worship. Stores were closed. Places of amusement shut down. Taverns were closed. In fact, when I grew up at Jeff, they were beer joints. We've sophisticated the taverns now, but they were beer joints when I grew up. Kramer beer joint. Never did go in, but I knew it was there. <coughs> I knew somebody was going to put that on the question. Benny, when did you go to the beer joint? <laughs> but, uh, Today, it's not like that. Sunday is the biggest day of pleasure. Well, the church having to compete with all the sports and on and on and on, and there's nobody loves pleasure anymore than I do. And I think I'm, Paul is just saying that in the last days, the mindset of a lot of people, you're going to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Someone has called it the pleasure generation in the United States alone the pleasure business has been growing at an average of over six billion dollars a year since 1965 and then there's the video games which rival TV itself one of the most pervasive sources of amusement estimated five billion or more is spent in a single year 
just on video games. There can be little doubt that we become a generation addicted to pleasure more than things of God. No conviction. Things that used to bother us don't bother us as much as anymore. But notice what Paul says in verse 5, along with this decline in any real interest in the things of God. Paul foresaw in the last days people would be marked by having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And then he adds, from such turn away. The word for power here is referring to the kind of power given by the Holy Spirit to the church. It's the word used to describe the saving power of the gospel. Paul, you remember in Romans 1.16, said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power, it's the dunamis, it's the dynamite. But Paul is describing here those that have a religious exercise. They go through the motions, they sing the songs, they pray the prayers, and yet there's no power. They still live defeated lives. No power, no joy, no song, <clears throat> no conviction. Let's hasten to the third group and then we'll conclude. We've seen the last days before the Lord comes, people without character, people without conviction, and now lastly, people <clears throat> without conscience. Now Paul foresaw a day here when spiritual wickedness, spiritual wickedness, apparently is going to masquerade itself successfully in religious disguise. And I think the Bible often reserves its most scathing words for those who propagate false religion in the name of Christ. And I think this is one of those areas that is a growing, a growing concern, referring to those who masquerade in, as Christians. In the last day, he writes this, for this sword, they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away, led away with divers lust, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he has something else to say. Now as Janus and Jambres, in verse 8, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth. Paul saw apparently these false subtle teachers as traitors, traitors to the faith. And it seems the Old Testament to which he's referring is Exodus chapter 7. It happened when Moses first appeared, goes before Pharaoh, as the liberator of the, of the Hebrew people. Now by law, remember, by Pharaoh's law, Moses should have been dead. But because of believing parents who prayed and being, Moses still alive. God's raising him up as the deliverer for Israel. So he goes, at Moses, and Aaron's with him. Aaron's with him. He was the snake handler, Bill. Anyway. <laughs> Wayman's the only preacher in this audience has his own snake handler. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. <clears throat> as long as I'm at Kramer, we've, we've never in 40 years gone into snake handling. And as long as I'm there, we'll never be a snake handling congregation. <laughs> Wayman's warming up at, at uh, where do y'all go to church? LaGrange. <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. <clears throat> Aaron's with him. Aaron's a snake handler here. At Moses' word, Aaron casts his rod down, becomes a serpent, right? And uh, at once the magicians of Egypt, they even take the miracle. He changed the water to blood. Magicians do the same thing. Brings frogs up. Magicians do the same thing. 
their sole purpose apparently is to resist and oppose the truth. What a wild example for Paul to use, but I think it's making sense. They resist, they oppose the truth of God and hold Pharaoh into uh, bondage and error. Paul names these two magicians. He holds them up as examples in the end times of false teachers who will likewise in the end times resist the truth of God. There's a real danger in that today. They deliberately oppose the truth. We would be astonished if we knew how many false teachers and apostate religious leaders there are who once knew the truth of God's word. The last thing Paul says, we're almost there. <coughs> Paul shows that eventually, eventually God draws the line on these false leaders, teachers, and he uh, reveals, he manifests their whole purpose. But then it says, but they will progress no further. They will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest unto all men as there's also a glimmer of hope. Even though this is a real danger, it's not going to last forever. Thank God for the truth of His Word. These people, these people are reckoned without God. God permitted, you know the story back in Exodus 7, the Egyptian magicians, he, he permitted them to do and to go just so far, but then he stopped them, stopped them in their tracks and exposed them as empty, shattered, and defeated. Likewise, God will show these end time false, allow these end time false teachers, some seemingly successful, but in the end, in God's own time, he will expose them for what they really are. Now, in the coming days, and I think especially during this period we call, we'll hear about it this week, of the Great Tribulation, Satan's two men, the beast and the false prophet, will become the supreme examples of false teachers, false deceivers. Apostasy is already on the rise. We're moving toward that direction, in that direction. The perilous time, the grievous times, the fierce times are upon us. As Paul wrote about, but in the end, Jesus Christ will come and with his word, he's going to defeat the enemy and gain the victory for the people of God. Amen. Now we are living, I believe, in the times before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, many are beginning to pray. As the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Maranatha, Maranatha, which means, oh Lord, come. I wonder, how have the signs of His coming affected your prayer life? Do you, do you feel your praying with a greater sense of urgency? Well, my prayers have been but after my study of science, I can honestly say, truthfully say, I'm not looking for any more science. I am looking for a Savior who will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we that are alive and remain will together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort, encourage one another with these words. Our prayer is that you've been encouraged and comforted tonight by these words. Now we're going to sing a song of invitation. Steve has announced 298. If there be one here tonight who needs to publicly make the profession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we invite you to come. Or if you're a child of God that is in any way subject to the invitation.
We ask you to come as together we stand and sing.